Hello, welcome back to Go on the Run. And today we will continue with our look at how to use Docker. In the previous video, we answered the question, what is Docker? And we installed Docker and we did a nice simple test to show that how using Docker, we can create these things called containers, which at the time we say is just this um, encapsulation of a running process, one or more processes. And we saw that how we had this container or we were able to create containers to represent that look like a Unix environment. And I did that even though I was on a Mac, but you can install Docker on Windows and also Linux and maybe some other operating system also. You can do essentially the same thing, but mostly Linux, um, Docker technology is ready for Linux, but you can still get it to work on Windows and Mac because they, in the background, spin up a Linux um, OS. But the details doesn't really matter for now. In this video, I want to answer what is a container? Because remember, with Docker, it allows you to create containers, manage containers, and all these other things. And we create containers from images. Today, I'm not going to talk much about images. We'll do that in another video, probably the next episode. So what is a container? Well, before we get back to that, let's just review what Docker is. So we said Docker is an application with abstract creation of containerized processes, right? Um, and a container runs one or more processes in isolation. So Docker, the application, abstract the creation of these containerized processes or putting processes within containers. And the benefit we get there is the enforcement of um, limitation of resources such as your CPU. You can say how much CPU. Um, you know, percentage of your CPU some container can use. Um, you can control the IO, whether they have access to different types of things like network, how much of it they can use and so on, the bandwidth, and of course, how much memory. And in addition to just creating, not only creating the containerized process, Docker also, the application allows you to manage these process. And we said that we can create a container, we can stop them, we can start them, we can delete them. So that's the management of these um, containerized processes. Uh, or rather I should say management of the container. And then of course these prices are within the container. And then um, we also said that the way you get a container is by creating it from an image, which I said we will talk about in the next video. Now, before we get much further, now would be a great time if you haven't yet subscribed to this channel. If you like the material, subscribe, do subscribe so you can see when I post new videos and hit the thumbs up button while you are, you're there. Now, what is a process? So, a process is something that the computer, the operating system manages, right? So within your operating system, a process is a set of resources managed by the OS for the runtime representation of an executable file. Now it may seem like there's a mouthful there, but the thing you really want to take away from this is your operating system has a set of resources that's disk, you know, network, monitor, keyboard, all of that RAM, all that is are the resources of the operating system and your operating system is put in place to manage this resource why because if you are a process and i'm a process we both might try to use this resources in competing way and so the operating system is sort of like the arbitrator who says who gets to use what and when and so the operating system manages the resources and what it does is it says when i want to carve up how resources use it essentially creates a process to represent that and the, how do you get a process? Well, you get an executable file, which since this is a Go channel, we know that you get by writing some code and creating an executable file. But we'll get back to that in a minute. Okay, when an executable is launched, right? Or when you start it or you, you execute it, you know, you execute a program, that's an executable. So when you launch, when you launch an executable, you, executable, you're essentially saying to the operating system, take this ex executable and create a process for me. Now, sometimes we say we have a running program or we might, somebody might say run this program for us or we have a program running. So we might use program to represent the actual file on this, the executable. And we might also use program to also represent the running representation of an executable file, which is a process. So some people might use, you might hear program being used in both the static representation where, you know, there's nothing happening. And then for the dynamic process, which is the dynamic representation of an executable, which is a process. But when we say process, we're talking specifically of the thing that is running and running and being managed by the operating system. You never hear anyone represent to so talk about a process as the file itself. Okay. Good. And so in other words, a process is created from an executable file. 
The way I like to think of this is if people who know object-oriented programming, or even in Go, let's stick with Go, you can create a structure, and so the structure is this static representation of how things should be laid out in memory, right? You know, you have a first name, there's a string, an age, that's an int, and that's just the description of it, essentially. And when you say new or you create a variable of that structure, that's when you have a value that is based off of that structure, that is defined by that struct. Right? And so that's like the equivalent of a process. So hopefully I didn't confuse you there, but try to draw a distinction between the static thing and then the runtime thing of which you can create multiple once you have that static representation. Once you define a struct, you can create many variables from it. Similarly, once you have an executable, you can create many processes from that one executable. Okay, so let's get back into source code versus executable. So as we know, you can start off with source, which is text that you can see and edit and so on. And that will probably look like my rather awesome program here. And now we feed this to the Go compiler. Now, things are going to be essentially the same for any source you write, like for C and you feed it to the C compiler or whatever, Java. Java is slightly different because Java has a runtime, a virtual machine, but don't worry about that. Essentially, you take a program that's source and you compile it and the compiler spits out an executable. What is the executable? That's the program that now you share with people and say, hey, run this on your computer. Of course, you have to produce an executable that's compatible for that operating system. So let's talk about Mac. I'm on a Mac right now. An executable for Linux wouldn't run on my Mac because the Mac OS, when it tries to read that file and look for the structure, look through the structure of the file, it wouldn't find the structure it expects. Similarly, if I create an executable for my Mac and try to run it on Linux, it's not going to work. The Linux operating system looks for a different structure and vice versa with Windows, okay? But regardless, the Go compiler, once you um, it knows which operating system you're trying to target, it will now create an executable file. We usually call this file a binary file. Why? Because com compare it to our text file where we can see it and edit it and read the characters. With a binary file, we usually can't read all the characters. So here I compile this program and it doesn't really matter what it actually looks like. We're not trying to understand the structure of it. Um, what we really want to see is what I did is I call this program XXD, which is just one of many binary edit um, editors or thing that allow you to see binary files. And when I compile my program, I call it main. And so I pipe it or pass it to this program called head to say, give me the first 20 lines. That's all this is. You don't have to worry about all these details. They, like I said, there are many, many binary um, dump program out there or utilities you can find. What we're interested in, in seeing is what's inside of this file. And so this first column, at least in how XXD printed out, this is the address or the offset within that file where you can find the bytes. Remember, you want to think of this file, main file, as having a long stream of binary of um, bytes, right? Binary data. I could have called the executable anything. I just so happened that it's called main here. When I see 000, this is the address or the beginning of that file. And so the very beginning of this file, we have this byte CF, okay? And then followed by another byte FA. And if you don't know how um, hexadecimal um, by data is represented, well, definitely take a look at my video on um, hexadecimal and uh, ASCII characters, um, you know, in um, section 24, episode one, where I cover that sort of thing. And so, if you see this file as a stream, this is the first byte and so on, I keep going, and you can see there are eight columns here. And each column, we have two bytes, right? Because you use two hexadecimal digit to represent one byte. Again, I'm not gonna spend time going through why. You can look at that episode 24, um, section 24, episode one to understand all that sort of thing. And so really we have 16 bytes in this first line. So if we have 16, why are we seeing the value 10 here? Well, this is an hexadecimal again. So one zero means 16. So since we start with an offset zero, this is zero, one, two, three, blah, 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 all the way out to 14, 15. And so that's 16 bytes because we start from zero through 15. And then the next line here, we start with 16, 17, and I keep going. And then of course here is 32, and we start with 32. So um, that's hexadecimal for you. Now on th this middle column then shows the content. So this is the actual bytes 
of that file, my executable program. Over here is what it looks like, the text for some of these characters. So some of these characters are not printable. And as you can see that all these characters here, you know, we have a byte here. That should be a character, but we see a dot just because it's not a printable character. Same thing with zero three is not a printable character, right? Now, I'm not saying three is not a printable character. This is the byte zero three and then the byte zero one, which character those represent, right? So those, those are not printable. So we don't see those, but the ones that are printable, the characters that are printable. So for example, we see underscore underscore and we can guess or figure out that how five F five F since it repeats, this 5s mean um, underscore, and there it is, underscore again. And then, you know, 50 or hexadecimal 50 means capital P, and 41 um, means A, and so on, right? And we can also see that E is 45, and that's why we have 45 here again, right? So you can go through and sort of figure this out. And here's capital R, and so that would be hexadecimal 52, right? I went through that um, on in this first column is just the address where you know every line is essentially 16 bytes, and so if we now go to the ASCII table that I mentioned um, that I showed in episode 20 um, section 24.1, you will see that oh, I cover this table on how you um, convert from decimal to binary to hexadecimal. Um, there's also octal, but you can see here is again is 52 and it means capital R. So now that we produced an executable from our source file by running through our compiler, and that has whatever information the operating system is targeting needs to run, now how do we create a, pro a process? So we have our executable, and we give that to the OS, and we say, hey, operating system, I want you to run this executable for me. And so the operating system then allocate resources, which is memory and CPU and all that stuff. If you don't have any memory, guess what? The operating system is like, no, I can't create a process for you. I don't have any resource. And so it creates this process. And the process is, like I said, how you encapsulate or manage these resources that the, um, the process needs, right? And so, for example, when you have an application running, a process, it not only needs memory, it needs CPU, it has things like file handles. File handles, are you might hear, you might sometimes hear people say file descriptors, represents to the, represent the network and the um, keyboard and monitor and all this other stuff. And, and then, of course, a process might have priority that you can change and a bunch of other things, right? All right. So that is how the operating system turns an executable into a process and some of the things that um, you know, process encapsulate. Now, let's talk about the OS and applications. And again, this is just an illustration to simplify things, okay? We're trying to understand. So like I said earlier, your OS is responsible for managing the resources on your computer, right? But what is a computer? A computer is a physical thing. It's like hardware, right? For most people. And so your computer has some amount of CPU available, CPU resource, like speed and so on. And RAM and you know the memory and I/O different things connected to it: a disk drive, a monitor, a camera, a microphone, all these other things, right? Those are I/O, right? Input, output. And what do you do? Well, the hardware is this static thing that doesn't do anything, but it has those things, right? And so now you might install some operating system, whether it's Mac, Linux, or Windows, or you know Plan Nine or some crazy thing. You install your operating system um, to manage the resource or use the resources in a sensible way. Now, the operating system itself um, is has several key components. Now, there's not all of them, but basically you can break them down as kernel modules and drivers. These are the individual things that knows how to talk to the specific CPU, talk to the specific type of RAM that you have and the different devices that you have, right? The microphone and all that stuff. So you have what's called drivers, which is software that know how to interact with those things. And then the kernel of the operating system, where it's like brains of the operating system, which is doing all the scheduling and all this other good stuff, right? Making decisions and so on and how to use these different resources, right? And with the Operating system also exposes is a set of system libraries for you to be able to use that operating system. Why system libraries? Because you don't have usually have direct access to the kernel, and not only that, the kernel interface is usually sort of uh, what they say a little bit difficult. So you have system library that sort of abstract how to talk to the kernel. 
And then of course the kernel is using the kernel modules and drivers to talk to the hardware. Now, what we say is that you're running some application on uh, OS. Now, the thing is we might say Microsoft Office on Mac or I'm running Internet Explorer on Windows. And so that's why I put it this way, because this is how you might hear people say it. But keep in mind that how the application is actually running within the confines of the OS, right? But we say on because it sort of abstract out the OS like this separate thing. So that's how I put it this way. Let me look at a very specific type of application. So here we have our hardware again and our OS. And let's say I have this application. And this application, it's a really fancy application. That's why I sort of drew it a little bit bigger. Um, why? Because this application, again, this application is running on my OS. This application could run probably on Mac, Linux, or Windows. It's just an application. And But what I decided to do is this application should simulate hardware. Now, that's why I put this hardware in star because it's not real hardware. The application is simulating how CPU behaves, how RAM behaves, how IO behaves, like keyboard and everything, right? It's simulating it, okay? Because at the end of the day, those kernel modules, they're talking to a physical device, but they're, the way hardware and software, that boundary, which is called embedded programming, the way that operates is that you can simulate the hardware. And so the software, the same exact software could, could run um, essentially um, if you provide it with those same input and output that it expects from hardware. And so my application here is very sophisticated. Not only does it simulate hardware, but since it simulates hardware, I can take the operating system from off the shelf that I would install on real hardware. And I'm going to say unmodified now, but for people who know this already, know that oh, there's an asterisk there with the unmodified operating system. But I'll just go in the store and buy my same Linux, Mac, and Windows, and I can install it on this simulated hardware because the software, once it's can talk to hardware and it gets what it expects, it doesn't really know or care whether that hardware is real, and I'm using air quotes, or simulated, as in the case of this fancy application. Now, if you check out my video on VirtualBox, in, and I'll put a link to it right here, um, in Just Stuff, I showed how you can use this program or this application called VirtualBox, which can run on Mac, Windows, and Linux. And you can essentially do this. You create simulated hardware, and then you can install an operating system. And so let me show you really quickly. I'm not going to go through too much detail how that actually worked, but I just kind of wanted to show you. So let's do this. So here I have the application VirtualBox by Oracle. And as you can see, I have several configuration here to, you know, pretend like um, these th th these are virtual operating system with their associated hardware. So if I say new, for example, I can give it a name and I can say test, you know, test machine or something like that, whatever. Um, and basically I can say that, oh, what I want to install, whether it's Mac OS I want to install or, or intend to install or Linux or Windows or some other operating system. Let's just put other for now. And, um, you know, version or something like that you can pick that sort of thing and then i can say continue and then i can say for the virtual machine so what i'm configuring is a virtual machine again it's like a physical machine but a virtual one i can say my virtual machine should have one gig of memory and this is going to come out of the 32 gigs of memory that's on my operating system and we'll get back to that and then i should say my virtual machine of course needs some storage hard disk these are the different types of hard drives that you can choose and I'm not going to go through whether it's dynamic or fixed, but now I can choose what size hard disk this can be, whether it's 50, uh, 500 megabytes or you know one gig or something like that for my, the virtual hard drive. Now, this hard drive is going to be simulated, right? But it's just a file on my Mac, but to that virtual this virtual machine I'm creating, it's going to look like a real hard drive because the software is sophisticated enough to do that. And now I create my virtual machine. So this is my virtual machine having a virtual hard drive and all these other things. And now I can configure it, you know, by then going in here and setting up even more details. Like for the system itself, I can say whether my virtual machine have a floppy drive or it actually have a um, CD-ROM. Of course, we selected a hard drive. Does it have network end capability? Um, I can choose what kind of processor it should simulate. Should it use one of my physical processor or two or more, or whatever? And you know, the display, how is it connected to my disk? How much display memory does it have? So I can go through and select all of these sort of thing. 
And for the CD-ROM that I'm going to have it simulate, I can link it to if actual CD-ROM that I have on my computer. So let's say I downloaded Linux or I have a Windows CD-ROM um, on my computer. I can then select this and point it to the actual CD-ROM data. And again, this is an unmodified operating system, which I can install on a physical machine or on this virtual machine. And I could set up the audio and all these other different things. But once I configure my environment, now I can start it. And what happens is it, seems it boots up this virtual environment, which has the link to the software, and I can then install that software in this virtual environment. And the software isn't the wiser because it has the environment that it expects. And so it can't tell the difference between running, and again, air quotes, it cannot tell the difference between running in a simulated machine versus running on a on real hardware. So I'm going to delete this because I don't really need it. And so I'm going to remove everything. OK, so let's get back now to our presentation. So if I am going to install a operating system in this virtual machine or VM, right, with this fake hardware, essentially, I can install any one of these operations, Mac, Linux, or Windows. And of course, those operating systems that I install will come with you know, the kernel driver, with the drivers it needs for this virtual hardware. And of course, the kernel, which is you know, the intelligence or the, the brains of the operating system. And then of course, system libraries. And once I have that, now this, virtual, this operating system running on virtual hardware, guess what? I can actually run an other application for that operating system. So an example of this would be that I have hardware and I have my Mac OS here that I have, and I'm going to call this the host OS. And I use the same vir v um, virtual box, for example, and I create a VM. And now I can run Ubuntu Linux as a guest operating system on my Mac. And now I can run Linux programs. So these app one and app two here in white, these are actually Linux programs that would not otherwise run directly on my Mac. Why? Because we said when you compile software, you know, source code from an executable, it is targeted to a specific operating system. So I, if I have some fancy or whatever interesting App, Linux app that I wanted to run, but I have a Mac computer, what I can do then do is install VirtualBox, create a virtual environment, go through the whole setup of an installation, and then I can still get to run my application, my Linux app within this Mac app called VirtualBox on my Mac OS. I know it's a bit to digest, and I can still run many other application, non-VM application here. So this could be like my word processor, my text edit, and these are all application for my Mac, okay? Whereas these white ones are application for my Linux OS. Okay, so this is nice and dandy that we can do this, but there are some issues here. There's some problems with this. And one of them is latency. And latency, well, the time it takes to get stuff done, essentially. And it's because when my app 2 here is running in this virtual environment, um, it's running on this real OS. But this OS is running on virtual software or um, hardware, which is hardware that's simulated. And now this is running on a, another OS which now has to talk to the real hardware to get, let's say my application here wants to print something to the screen. Well, it has to come out on a real screen. Well, I could put it on a virtual screen too, but let's say I want to see it on my real screen. It has to go through all these layers to be able to come out to my physical um, computer and show on the real screen. Or even if I type on the keyboard, well, that information have to go back in through all these layers. And even the simulated hardware, the CPU is not simulated. That's real CPU. As you can see, when I was creating that virtual machine just now, I had to select how much RAM I should give my virtual hardware. And that is RAM that is going to be allocated from my real computer. So I have a 30, I have 32 gigs of RAM on this Mac. And so every time I create a virtual machine and I say, oh, run it with one gig or two gig, it's taken away from that available memory that these other application, my Mac application have because well, hey, th this is a virtualized machine, but it needs real memory. So the other issue is security. So let's say one of these application is somehow compromised or has some security loophole. Well, someone who gains access to this application could, and I can expose this application because remember, 
it can have access to my IO, which means not only the keyboard and monitor, but also the network. So this application here in this virtual machine can appear on my network like a real machine, like a web server or something. And so users can come with this application have a compromise, users can get into this application and then compromise the virtual OS by taking down the OS and therefore taking down all my other critical application or also access in my database. Again, let's say there's a database, one of these applications, a database application and so on. And if you remember, when we created this virtual machine, we had virtual hard drive. So there's data stored there and maybe this compromised application could access that information. And then there's this tight coupling, right? Once you have a virtual machine like this, you're definitely gonna wanna run many applications within it, and within it and so those are all coupled together and maybe have some type dependency on each other and just managing them um, i showed you just one instance here but what if you have some other application that needs to run another type of linux instead of a ubuntu maybe centos or arc linux or maybe you want to have a windows vm or a mac vm all this, yes, you can certainly create many more virtual hardware as you can, you saw, I had about five or six in my um, virtual box. And I could, once I have enough physical memory to run them, I can store, I can start all of them, right? So there's no limit except for the physical resources you have to run all these things. But of course you, you have to be able to manage them, right? Cause you have all these things that are, are running and so on. And of course, I, um, scalability, how do you manage many of these things on one host and so on? Um, and the resource utilization. If I give one of my virtual machine, let's say two gigs of RAM, it doesn't mean that all the application within this virtual machine is using all the memory, the two gigs that I give it. And so some of that is wasted and therefore not available to my OS and therefore certainly not available for me to create another virtual machine. So resource utilization is not the most optimal model when you use virtualization. And there are many more and more issues. So how does this, uh, what does this have to do with containers? Well. When we have containers, what we said, remember, a container is a containerized or encapsulation of a set of processes, right? One of the things that we can do is we can look at this, for example, we can say, what if the host OS and the guest OS had something in common? Like in this case, even though I'm running CentOS here as my host, I'm running Ubuntu Linux and CentOS is, for, is a Linux distribution and I'm running Ubuntu Linux as the guest well, the Linux kernel is essentially the same between the two. And then the drivers, the kernel modules driver are the same. So what I can then do is I start getting rid of stuff. I can get rid of the kernel because I already have one below in the host OS, and I can get rid of the kernel module there in my virtual um, VM because I already have it on the real OS. And the system library, well, that is where the distinction comes in when you have a distribution. It's in the set of libraries and how they're packaged and what version they are that makes you know Ubuntu Linux different from CentOS. So because that is different, I'll keep it, but I can get rid of the kernel and the kernel module, right? Essentially. And so um, now that I have that done that, and I can get rid of the virtualized hardware also. I don't need to virtualize the hardware because, well, I'm using Linux kernel and the kernel module, so they're talking to the real hardware, so I don't need fake hardware. And so with that in place, now I can sort of make my application one here, the thing that I'm running on this OS, not have to be in another app, but simply a process that is part of my CentOS. As you can see, app one and app two are running in CentOS. The only difference is that app two is using the system libraries that are provided by CentOS, and app one is using the system libraries provided by Ubuntu. And so by encapsulating or creating a container for these system libraries for Ubuntu, I have now made it possible for app one to just be a, another process on my Linux, uh, my CentOS. And so as you can see, with the system libraries from Ubuntu, I can use reuse the kernel, kernel module and hardware. And so immediately we can see that we cut down on the latency and if we know to containerize this properly, even if this app is compromised, it shouldn't affect my other app because it's running within a confined environment, right? I have to make sure that I could confine it. And that's where the container comes in. So hopefully you see 
immediately some of the benefits that we have by being able to move from a virtual machine to a container. And so let me show you um, something about what I mean when we run something as a container. If you notice here, I said that app one, app two, app three are all processes being managed by the host OS. The only difference is app one is somehow in some kind of container where it's limited, you know, where limits can be defined. Now, all these other apps can have limits defined, but here we have extra limits placed on it because of the libraries and stuff it's gonna be used to pretend like it's a different OS, right? And so let's go take a look. So I'm going to go to my Linux so I can run Docker on my Mac, but I wanna run it on my Linux computer to show you. So here I am on my Linux box. And so we can do Docker PS. I don't have anything running. And so we know to run a container, we can say Docker run, and we can say like Ubuntu, I want to run Ubuntu, for example. And if I did that, um, it was just download a container, try to spin up a, con sorry, download the image if I don't have it downloaded already, but I have the Ubuntu image and it's gonna try and create a container, but it doesn't have any command to run, so it would quickly create that container and just exit, and so I don't see anything. Now I can give the command that I wanna run, which is something like bash, but um, what it does is it creates a process within that container using bash as the executable, but again, that I didn't do anything within that shell, the bash shell that was created. So again, it exits. So what I can do is say that oh, um, what I want to do is attach an interactive terminal to this container. And so once I do that, now I can have my bash shell here and I can interact with it. So now I'm within the Docker container. And so if I type um, hostname CLT, for example, uh, oh, I don't have that command here. Um, I can do cat slash um, uh, LSB, you know, release, right? And we can see that, oh, I have a um, Ubuntu environment. Now, the thing is, let's now run a command within here. So I can do, um, for example, I can do while true do sleep uh, maybe print out hello um, echo hello world and then sleep five seconds and then do it keep doing it right and so this is a while loop that's just going to go forever and um, every five seconds is going to print out hello world so here's the thing I said that well, when you run a container that container is running as a process or containerized process on the real OS. So not only is my while loop running this echo and sleep on this Unix box, even though it's in a container, and we can see this by doing ps minus efw. And if I grab for, you know, bash, for example, we can see that here is a process called Docker run, which is what I run. But then one of these bash is also a bash that's running inside of my container. And if I grab for, you know, echo, I should see once in a while there's an echo. Of course, I have to be able to catch it. Um, let's see, what about while? Yeah, I'm not going to be able to, to catch it. Um, sleep. Uh, yep, there is the sleep command that's running. Um, I couldn't catch the well, and but you can see here's the sleep command that I have running inside of that Docker container. So the process is on this same OS, it's just that it's containerized. So how do I know this for sure? Well, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to watch it. And by sitting there, you're going to see that, oh, here's that sleep command that's, um, that's running. And now I'm going to go back up here and I'm going to control C, stop it. And you should see that sleep command go away and it does go away. And if I exit here, I'm out of my container. So even though I was inside a container, the process was running on the same OS, proving that even though we're containerized, because we are now not running a VM, we're using the same kernel from the post operating system. We don't, our guest operating system is really just this unique set of libraries and 
we use the kernel from the host. Okay, so this is a lot. I think I'm gonna end it here. Now, if you made it this far, I hope that you stick, stuck around because you like the material. So um, please thumbs up the video, leave a comment and subscribe. Now, I wanna say thank you to someone who has made a contribution to the channel, a financial contribution. And so I want to acknowledge this. This was a few months ago. I failed to do it in my previous video. I'd like to say a special thank you to Rita Bennett for being a financial supporter on the channel. Um, now, Rita was just the first, but hopefully there'll be more of you. Anyway, Rita, thank you very much. Um, you made a financial contribution more than a month ago, and sorry, I'm not getting around to it. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Appreciate it. Okay, so that's it. I hope you enjoyed the video. Take care. Have a great rest of the day. Bye.